The White Pill is available now at whitepillbook.com. This episode is brought to you by Patriot Gold. Good afternoon, Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. We have with us one of my favorite guests, one of my good friends, Dave Rubin. You know him as the host of the Rubin Report. He's been killing it with locals. Uh, my community is malice.locals.com, doing great work with Rumble. His two books have been great successes, Don't Burn This Book and Don't Burn This Country. Uh, Dave, thank you so much for making the time to come here. The reason I wanted to talk to you is I've been seeing you getting a little heated on Twitter. And more broadly speaking, you and I have been at this for a minute. What's going on in the Republican Party right now is something that I can honestly say I've never seen anything like this before. Because if you ask people in a year ago, right, conservatives, who would you like to see as the nominee, DeSantis or Trump? I think to a man, or maybe 90%, they'd say, man, we got two great choices. You know, it's a wonderful position to be in. It's not like having to choose between Kamala Harris or Joe Biden. <laughs> like these are both guys who have a lot going for them. Now, you know, even before DeSantis announced, we're hearing that DeSantis is a rhino. Uh, DeSantis is a Zionist, so you should vote for Trump, <laughs> who's apparently somehow not a Zionist. Yeah. It, there's, uh, and that DeSantis is basically another Jeb Bush or another Biden. I saw you get into it with Vivek. Uh, we'll get into that in a second on Twitter. Um, what is your view on all this? Because you're kind of in the center uh, of all this. You've been a supporter of president trump you voted for him twice i asked you on the phone and uh, I, I, once once just to be clear i voted for him once the first the first time around i voted for gary johnson i was oh. really on the fence either way and at the last second you'll love this malice i'm in I'm, i lived in west hollywood at the time yes the gayest freaking place on earth thank god i no longer live there i'm at the the polling place and you know who i'm standing behind at the polling place who rupaul no. I'm standing behind RuPaul, who at the time was dressed normally as a man, not as yeah. RuPaul the drag queen, but I'm standing behind RuPaul going, do I vote for Hillary, who I hate, Trump, yeah. who I'm like, what the hell is this thing? And then at the last second, I was just like, you know what, in honor of marijuana, I'll vote for wow. Gary Johnson. And I pulled the lever. But yes, I very openly and proudly Really, I mean it, proudly supported Trump last time around. So sure. here's the Media Matters headline. Dave Rubin looks at RuPaul and thinks, what the hell is this thing? <laughs> <laughs> we all heard you say it. Um, but you are, you were, Trump had been on your show. You, you, and I asked you this on the phone. You'd say it publicly. If it's Trump versus Biden, you'd pick Trump so quickly your finger would break. It's not even a question. Not but even a question at all. Look, at the end of this, and obviously I like DeSantis a lot, and my life, quite literally, having lived in California yes. for eight years before I moved to Florida a year and a half ago, my life has been transformed in large part because of what Ron DeSantis did. And it's not just me, it's about the 1.3 other million people who have moved to Florida uh, since COVID. 1,200 people a day still now are coming to Florida. I mean, it's incredible what's going on here. Uh, so as I always tell people, it's like, and I'm happy to do whatever you wanna do as always, Michael, but you know, we can debate policy all the time, but in some ways, all you have to look at are where are people going right. and where are they fleeing? 1.5 million people about have fled California, almost a million have fled New York, and where are they going? Mostly to Florida, then in large part to Texas. You're, you're a New York guy who's yep. now in Texas, and they're going to Tennessee and Montana and a couple other states. But the point is nobody's going the other direction. But right. yes, if at the end of this thing, if the DeSantis thing doesn't work for whatever reason or or Trump gets this incredible bump because of all the the persecution and prosecution he's going through right now, which also I'm happy to talk about. Uh, if it ends up that Donald Trump is my president in January of 25 and Ron DeSantis is back here as my governor, I will be very happy. That doesn't mean I think he is the best choice to be president. I clearly think DeSantis is a better choice to be president. Um, but that does not leave me in a, in some sort of a shitty situation. What a shitty situation will be that somehow Trump and DeSantis really destroy each other or the machine destroys them both. We end up with an incapacitated, I almost did a Biden as I was 
uh, talking about Biden. We end you, up with an incapacitated pass? Biden or, I mean, Kamala is incapacitated in a different right, way, yes. or they figure out how to make the Newsom thing happening, which I still think, uh, you know, is, is sort of in the works with whatever's going on with that, that deeply, you got to admire it, that deeply, deeply corrupt uh, Democrat party. Yeah, um, that's what's funny to me. Like, I see a lot of uh, just as a sidebar, you see a lot of people whose opinion I respect really jumping on this RFK bandwagon. And I, lot, I like a lot of what RFK is saying. But the idea that he will become the Democratic nominee is so removed from any possibility of reality. Uh, it would it would be far easier for Ron Paul to have been the Republican nominee. And we knew there was no chance that they would ever let anything close to that happen. So it's just wacky to me that people think he's got a path. Michael, it would be far easier for him to become the Republican nominee yes, yes. than the Democrat nominee. People don't under, I, I don't understand actually for people that pay attention. I get it, it's one thing, the average guy who's not paying that much attention, but for people who have paid any level of attention to politics in the last decade, if you do not see how deeply, deeply corrupt the Democrat party is, what they will do to the insurgents. Look, I think Bernie's wrong about basically everything and socialism and uh, collectivism and rejiggering an economy and giving to some and taking from, of course, I think he's wrong about all those things, but was he the guy and did the party rig it against him for sure once and probably twice? The answer to that obviously is, is yes. You have to give the Republicans credit or the RNC, I would say, you have to give them credit when Trump yeah. was the insurgent. And he was going after everybody. And you remember that week, he took out Rubio, little Marco, and he took out Lion Ted, and he took out Jeb, and he's taking everybody out. Everybody was like, what the F is going on here? But the party didn't pull any shenanigans to stop him. They said, these are the rules we have. We may not love it, <laughs> but here we go. And by the way, then he turned out to be, a, you know, COVID notwithstanding, turned out to be a pretty great president, regardless, I think, if whether you're a Democrat or Republican. So let's talk a little bit about this. Let's talk about your relationship with the DeSantis campaign, because there is this kind of idea in social media that anyone who currently likes DeSantis, who was recently reelected with record numbers over someone who had previously been a governor, uh, someone who is currently a member of the House, you know, universal name recognition in Florida and, and had been elected, which is not an easy feat to do in any state. Uh, are you somehow on the take for the DeSantis campaign, have you been bought? You know, there's this, by the way, just a side note, some, like there's this argument that like all these senders are bought and paid for by the NRA, as if, if I'm from Wyoming or Montana, I'm secretly a gun grabber. And only when the NRA gave me a hundred grand, I'm like, oh, wait a minute, I'm gonna be a moderate. It's just a bizarre thing. So what yeah. is your relationship with the DeSantis campaign, if any? Well, first off, I just wanna say, and, and truly I want your answer on this. Is there anyone on earth and I mean that on planet Earth, who has been more public about their support uh, of what's going on in Florida than me. I, I don't know that there has been no. anybody, and I genuinely, maybe DeSantis himself, <laughs> sure. but I mean, besides DeSantis, you know, in the year and a half that I've been here, the amount that I have talked about Florida, moved two companies here, had kids here, expanded my family here, um, seen the success and, and been part of the success. And all of those things, I, I mean, every single day I talk about it. So the idea that I'm doing this because I'm taking money from them is completely insane. I have never taken a dime from them. Actually, uh, I think you said to me right before we started, you're holding this for a day. So we're, we're taping this, today's Tuesday. I think you said yes. you're airing it on Wednesday. I'm doing an event with DeSantis on Saturday in Reno. It's the first actual political event that I've ever done, like actually with the candidate, with the exception of when I campaigned with Larry Elder for the recall in California, which I did not take a dime for. And I love Larry Elder and I was doing it because I believed in the fight against Gavin Newsom. And that's exactly what I'm doing with this thing. I'm not taking a dime from them. I'm taking a day off my show and I'm gonna go to, re it turns out to have to be a three day operation because I have to leave on Friday, it's Saturday morning. I don't get back till Sunday. And I'm doing it because I believe that this guy is the best without question candidate for presidency of the United States. And I think, America is so obviously banged up between the wokeness and inflation and all of the stuff that we know. There's one guy who has, who has almost without exception, I'd love to hear the exception if you can think of it, every single thing that this guy has set out to do, he has accomplished. And not only accomplished it, but then won by massive landslides as he's doing it. You referenced that he barely squeaked by the first time, 30,000 votes, over a guy who turned out to be a gay meth addict. I have no problem with gays, my husband. Wait, wait, you don't know that he's an addict. He could be an aficionado. <laughs> a meth admirer, I don't know. Yes. Okay, fine, fine. He dabbled in the meth, let's just yeah. say. 
But, but DeSantis beats him by 30,000 votes. And by the way, Trump deserves credit. He backed DeSantis, that helped DeSantis. There's, there's no doubt about it, great. He then, by fighting wokeness, fighting the neo-racism, fighting the gender stuff, fighting Disney, fighting the, the pharmaceutical industry and big tech and everybody when it came to COVID and mandates and all that, he does everything right. And then you know what happens? He wins by 1.6 million votes, right. uh, 20, basically 20%. He flips places like Miami red. I mean, Florida is basically the reddest state in the nation and they're not coming for the gays and they're not coming for the blacks. Actually, Florida has number one small business black ownership in the United States uh, and call me crazy, but I think black people are much like white people in that they just want safe streets and they want functioning infrastructure and they want a chance to do whatever they want with their lives. That's a great, it's a great place to do that here in Florida. Um, so no, my support is 100% because I think this is the guy that actually can turn it around. I think Trump can talk about turning it around. I, I just don't think he can do it at this point. I think, you know, Trump also has another problem beyond the legal stuff, which is I think good people are afraid to work for him at this point. I, I think unfortunately he has turned on everybody who he ever brought in, you know, with the exception really of his kids and I'm friends with his kids. And I, you know, we've, I, I said this on my show. I recently texted uh, Junior and Ivanka. I know them better than I know uh, Eric. And I said, hey, you know, I know we're sort of on different sides of things at the moment. I hope we're good to go. And I always value friendship more than politics. They both immediately responded, yes. And they're invited to my birthday party in two weeks. You're invited too, invites are going out today. So hopefully you can get over to Florida. But, but the point is, I think there's a better option than Trump now. I think it's DeSantis. I think most people know it. And just one other thing, you know, you said for, for those of us that are sort of been in this for a while and, and internet creatures like you are who, who understand how the trolling works and all this stuff, unfortunately, it was just going to end up this way, right? It was going to get nasty no matter what. I think the thing that sucks is that from what I can see, and maybe you see it a little differently, from what I can see, for the most part, DeSantis gets up there, says what I think is, is basically true. And then the Trump people are just basically lying about him in Florida constantly, whether it comes to COVID or whatever else. And then the DeSantis people are pushing back. I, I don't see a lot of it the other way, but I get it. We're all in our own silos. So maybe you're seeing something that I'm not, but it's the internet and people were going to be mean and put up deceptive videos and, and all the rest of it. But th that's the thing, like th th why I'm kind of surprised is I did expect it to get heated and get ugly, but some of the things that are being said just se don't seem to make sense to me. And what an example you just mentioned, Trump is very big and Trump's team is very big on saying he deserves credit for the DeSantis win, putting him over the top with Andrew Gillum uh, four years ago. But then does he get blamed for Herschel Walker and Dr. Oz? You can't have it both ways. If he gets credit for the wins, he has to get credit for the losses. And, you know, after the midterms, which for the Republic, I was at the blaze on the air and it was like attending a funeral because uh, at the same time, they understand the Republican Party is not going to save them. But the other hand, like having 51 Democratic senators is the final nail in the coffin of America. But, you know, there was this thing that like 90 percent of the people Trump endorsed won. Yeah, but yeah, 90 percent were not in swing races the big ones carrie lake who is a phenomenal candidate she's been on the show a couple of times i i think she's a very very telegenic to put it mildly oh, yeah. again herschel walker dr oz these were big races they were all winnable races they all lost um so and desantis had huge coattails to the point where the republicans i think for the first time possibly ever have super majorities in the state legislature yeah well michael you know what's interesting that night uh, of the red wave that didn't happen that midterm election. I, I was supposed to be with you in Dallas with the Blaze guys, but then uh, like a day or two before, uh, the DeSantis people reached out to me. They said, hey, do you want, they knew they were gonna win. They were like, do you wanna come to the victory party? I was like, hey, maybe I'll broadcast. They said, sure. Yeah. I, they, I literally, they didn't give me anything. I got a table and my guys came and, and we, we were on air as he was, you know, he won obviously the second the polls closed basically. And then it was a huge celebration, but the juxtaposition and this is why I love what's happening in Florida so much. America is so banged up. We all know it. None of the, the, the financial stuff makes any sense. This ridiculous war, non-war in Ukraine, all of the woke stuff, boys or girls, all the stuff, right? But I'm in a place where it's all working. So that night, and I feel this all the time because I do a show about national politics like you do or, or cultural issues that go beyond the state you live in. My life and everything I see on the ground here is wonderful. I'm seeing a state and, a, and I'm, I'm in the Miami suburbs. I'm seeing an area that's flourishing and building and new people coming here and people, everyone gets it. I wear my Florida hat wherever I go and everybody's always talking about make America Florida and all that stuff. So on election night, 
we're expecting the red wave. It ends up being, in essence, a disaster. I mean, they did get the house, but that took a little time to shake out and whatever else. But what I saw on the ground in Florida, and that night I interviewed the, the lieutenant governor and a bunch of Congress people here in Florida, and it was just like, it was pure joy because it was like, okay, America's banged up. We know it's banged up. We got to get through two more years of Biden and this lunacy no matter what, but we're okay here. So the funny thing is I get the argument that I hear from some Floridians. Why send DeSantis out there? Why send him to the swamp? Why send him in? We're sending our best guy. But if we're at the point in America where we have our best guy and we're saying, no, no, best guy, you don't go. We're gonna just send out these half-assed nobodies and they'll just always end up as chum. Well, then we've really lost already. I, I think the anarchist part of you probably is okay with that. I, I, don't, I don't know that I'm quite there on that yet. I, I, I wanna try it one more time and see if we well, can fix it. The anarchist part of me, which does enjoy the chaos in kind of back and forth, also likes it when it's based on like going for the juggler and being rooted somewhat in reality. Mm -hmm. And this claim that like, DeSantis is a rhino. I don't understand it because let's go through the issues. A cultural war, he's to the right of Trump. Uh, abortion, six weeks ban, that's to the right of Trump. Um, that's to the right of me, by the way, as yeah, well. And people say I don't criticize right him. That happens to be the right of me. It just, yeah, that, so it, it is. He's, he's the governor. He's, he's been taking on corporate America, which is something that I, for a long time, have tried to wake up conservatives to because historically there's this belief and not inaccurately like the Mitt Romney wing that the chamber of commerce Republicans, the, the corporations are your friends. And I'm like, these people are soulless and they're often more malevolent than the government because they're empowered to be. Um, at the same time, and, and Trump took L after L after L, but here's a criticism of DeSantis that I think is a very strong one, which is we don't know what he's going to be like on foreign policy. It's certainly possible that he is a closet neocon. A good example, this is Obama, who in 2008 is like anti-war, 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 gets in the White House and he starts you know, bombing in the Middle East just as much as anybody else. Question might be, okay, how much clout does the president actually have? Uh, the military bragged about lying to Trump, the commander in chief, and the corporate press just all applauded. Something in any other context would have been one of the biggest scandals in American history. What do you think DeSantis's foreign policy would look like? Okay, so first off, I actually think that's a completely legitimate uh, critique, and it's something that he has to address. You have to remember, the guy's only been in the race two weeks, and yeah. he was the governor of Florida. So as the governor of Florida, you don't have to say a whole lot about politics. Now, he did issue that statement to Tucker that I was pretty happy with. Then, then everyone said he backtracked it. I wasn't quite sure that what he backtracked What was the statement? I'm not aware of this. Can you let you remember? Know? You remember this about two months ago. So, I mean, it was still when Tucker was on Fox, when Tucker took statements from all the presidential candidates about what they would do in Ukraine. And in essence, oh, yes. he said, he, in essence, he said, look, this is a territorial dispute. The United States cannot solve everything. And, you know, we should not, I, I don't, I don't want to I quote it exactly because I don't remember the exact quotes, but it, sure. basically he was giving a more isolationist approach, which certainly to my libertarian side, I definitely appreciate, and I think the base gets that more. And it was it was sort of in line with where Trump is. Now, I would say that one thing that should, should probably qualm some of the fears related to will he become Obama? Now, and you're right, by the way, the reason that Obama beat Hillary, if people really remember, was because that was still as we were trying to you know wrap up or whatever you want to call it the Iraq War, which was so attached to G, uh, George W. Bush, and Hillary kept saying, "Well, we need a managed withdrawal, and we have to take our time." And Obama just went up there with hope and change and we're gonna get the hell out, blah, 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 blah. Which by the way, I mean, in essence, I guess he did end it, so to speak. But then, as you said, we're drone striking American citizens. The guy did a whole bunch. We had a kinetic military action yeah. in Libya, which is now a failed state. Nobody talks about that. So Obama really failed on, the, on that hope and, change, hope and change promise, obviously. I would say this, you know, DeSantis, if you look, first off, you know, he was one of the Freedom Caucus guys as a congressman. So that generally tends to be the more liberty-minded people. Who are the congressmen that like him the most right now? Chip Roy, who's like the most libertarian congressman you can get, endorsed him before he even announced. Thomas Massey, who is the, the libertarian dream in essence, is also one of his best friends and, and backers right now. Um, you know, this is where I would say you have, we have to see a little bit more, but I don't think there's any evidence whatsoever that suddenly he's going to get into office and be like, the United States must bring democracy to Syria. I, I just see no evidence for it. I don't think the American people have the appetite for it anymore. Uh, you know, I know that you and I, and let's say the, the Trump base tend to be more isolationist in general, 
But I don't think the average American anymore, especially after watching the Biden bungling with this yeah. thing and, and seeing the, the amount of money we're giving and all of this stuff while our borders are open, I don't think people want those adventures anymore. I also think the world has changed in a lot of ways where it, it just is not possible to build nations the way that it was. So I, I think that's a fair criticism in that we, there's gonna be a little learning curve on that specifically. Hey guys, did you know that your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? And if you wake up too hot or too cold, then I recommend you check out Miracle Made's bed sheets. They're inspired by NASA, and Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics and makes temperature regulated bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. They're thermoregulating, designed to keep you at the perfect temperature. You get better sleep every night infused with silver, the sheets are. They prevent up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, they stay cleaner and fresher three times longer. No more gross odors. I know a little bit about that. Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag for other luxury brands. Feel as nice, if not nicer, than bed sheets used by some five-star hotels. Stop sleeping in bacteria, which can clog your pores, which causes breakouts and acne. Sleep clean with Miracle. Here's what you got to do. Go to trymiracle.com slash malice to try Miracle made sheets today. And if you're buying them for yourself as a gift for a loved one, Father's Day ends on Sunday. If you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use code MALICE at checkout, you get three free towels and save another 20%. Here's the kicker. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you don't like it, you get a full refund. So upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash MALICE. Use code MALICE. Get your three-piece towel set for free and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash MALICE to treat yourself. Thank you, Miracle Maid, for sponsoring this episode. Hey, folks, Michael Malice here, tolerated author, Twitter asshole, and sheath underwear model. I love wearing sheath. I wear it every single day. They're the most comfortable briefs you'll ever wear. And I'm currently designing a new pair of sheath based on a certain type of fish, which you'll see in the coming months. Every time you hear my voice, you should know I'm wearing sheath. And what makes sheath different is that they have dual pouch technology. They have one pouch for one part of your male anatomy, another pouch for another part of your male anatomy. Sounds weird, but when you put them on, they're going to be super comfortable. They keep you cool in the hot weather, keep you nice and snug in an interview, on a date, doing a podcast, so on and so forth. After you tried Sheath, you're never going back to the other brands. Support the underwear that supports you. Go to sheathunderwear.com, use promo code MALICE, you get 20% off. That's sheathunderwear.com, promo code M-A-L-I-C-E, 20% off. They've got shirts. They've got hoodies. They've got mesh ones. They have something for you. They also have a girl's line, but since women aren't allowed to listen to the show, I can't help you. Sheathunderwear.com, promo code MALICE. Let's get back to the show. The, the, the criticism of him that I find the most bizarre, for lack of a better word, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, and you're going to laugh when I ask the question, this idea that Ron DeSantis is bought and paid for by George Soros. Can, can we, and, and, and as we're both Jews, so let's also uh, like make it clear that criticizing George Soros is not endorsing the Holocaust. As, <laughs> First as off, from the Atlantic George, like Soros, George Soros' actions would probably put him as one of the most anti-Semitic characters in the history yes. of the world in a lot of respects, not only because of his childhood in Hungary, uh, but also because of his endless activism and the amount of money he puts into NGOs that are constantly trying to destroy Israel and a whole bunch of other stuff. By the way, the same people that say if you criticize George Soros, you're an anti-Semite, they spend all day criticizing Ben Shapiro, which, by the way, doesn't make them anti-Semites. No, so not at all. Right. It, it, it's so stupid, it's ridiculous. So let, let's just get rid of that. There is, you know, the only evidence that Ron DeSantis has any connection to George Soros is that we had one Soros-backed DA in Florida, in Tampa, and you know what he did? He fired him. So there is every bit of evidence that DeSantis would not put up with this nonsense, as opposed to, say, California, where they've installed many, many Soros DAs who literally, they go from one city and destroy another. I mean, the guy, uh, George Gascon, who's the DA of, of LA right now, he's the former DA of San Francisco. So he literally destroyed San Francisco turned it into a zombie movie, and now he moves down to LA. That's what they do in the Democrat party. There is no connection there. And by the way, on the, this is why I've been so disappointed with Trump, because when he says these things that he knows are not true, he, his base, the base of the base, I'm not talking about the average Trump supporter or the average Republican. 
the base of the base, that let's say that's the 20% sort of unmovable, he can do no wrong, he's orange Jesus, that sort of thing. They believe everything he says. Ron DeSantis, like I think it was two or three weeks ago, said, I think he said that he has spoken to, he has not spoken to Paul Ryan once since, he, since he's been governor. That's six years now, basically. And he has only spoken to Karl Rove once in his life. And I, I think, someone can check me on this. I think he said it was when he was in Congress. They have nothing to do with the campaign. Soros has nothing to do with the campaign. It's just lies. And that's why it's been so, that's why I've been hitting Trump. I, trust me, I wake up in the morning. I do not want, I see it. I'm laying in bed. I grab my phone. I usually try to keep my phone not in the bedroom, but sometimes it's on my nightstand. When I wake up and then I immediately see Trump said this crazy shit about DeSantis and Soros or Florida was bad with COVID or whatever. I'm just like, ugh, because I don't want to have to do it. It's not fun to fight Trump and then I get all the angry people on Twitter and everything else. But I do think it's important to fight for truth and, and to watch Trump attack Florida. That day when he sent out that crazy, long, rambling diatribe about how Florida was horrible under COVID, it was like, dude, you, it literally, it felt like you were attacking my family and my home because this place was the refuge that I fled to yes. in the middle of all that. And that's why it's been so disappointing. There is a case to be made for Trump. But as I say on my show every day, Don, if you're watching, make the case. There's a case. I did it once before. I learned from my mistakes. You know, I, I'm funded by myself, so nobody can get to me, blah, blah, blah. Make that case. But if your case is, I'm going to break the legs of the guy that we all know is the best, who I endorse twice, who I live in his state, my entire family moved here, my grandkids all live here, all moved during COVID to live freely, I would prefer something a little bit better. That's all I'm saying. Let me let me make the case and hear your, your yeah, please, uh, response. Please. Especially with these two uh, um, um, prosecutions going on, there's Georgia might be on the pipeline. The argument is if you do not stand up and support Trump when he is under unprecedented, whether justified or otherwise, legal assault, uh, no president has ever been faced federal prosecution, you are basically validating the future use of the legal system against one's political opponents. So you have to vote for Trump if only to show these people that they can't get away with it. And DeSantis is young and he can run again in four years. I think that's a very strong argument for Trump. Uh, well, I think that's, it's an interesting, I would say thought experiment more than anything else because you could be very angry about what they're doing. And let me be very clear about this. This is absolutely political. It's political persecution. You know, Trump, Put aside the New York case for a second, because the New York case, which is about a rape, non-rape and whatever, let's just move that one aside. It doesn't sound like too much will come out of that. This, this new case that we're dealing with now, and, and literally as we're taping this, right, this moment, I think it's about to start at yes. the, within the hour at the Miami courthouse. By the way, I mentioned it on my show, it is worth mentioning, it has nothing to do with Florida. It's a federal court. There are federal right. courts in every state. So this is not some DeSantis, you know, move to trap him in Florida, something like that. This case is a little Wait, bit. Different. I gotta interrupt you. Yeah. Just trap him in Florida. He lives in Florida. So there's something no, 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 in no. economics called revealed preferences. Yeah. And if I tell you that I love apples and I'm never buying apples, I don't really love apples. So if you're telling me Florida is terrible, you have 80 houses all over the world. You're living in Florida. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but I think it's worth mentioning because I think people are like, oh, he's being dragged to a courthouse in Florida. It must be that DeSantis has yeah, something right. to do with it and it has nothing to do with DeSantis. I think that uh, let's well let's put the uh, the selective prosecution aside for a sec, but we will hit that, and I'm completely in agreement with you on that because it, it is evil, and that's what they're doing. I think there is a much bigger issue with this case because if you read it, and I read most of it, um, you know, he it sounds like he really did do some illegal things for sure. Like there's there's a part of it of the um, indictment where he read classified documents. He actually showed classified maps to a member of one of his PACs, one of his political action committees, and even said to the guy, this is classified, I'm not allowed to show this to you. Now we'll find out if all of that is true, but, I, but I, the reason I'm saying that is I think two things can be true at the same time. It is obviously political persecution, and if he was not running again, I think they would probably let him go off into the sunset and that would be it. So 100%, no daylight. But it is also possible, he's kind of sloppy. He doesn't really control his mouth. Is it very likely or, or certainly probable that he brought somebody into an office, had a classified document that was there, the map, I don't know what the map was, but was like, you know, you're not supposed to really see this, but you know, 
Like that is possible. Now, is it possible that Joe Biden did it too? Sure. Is it also a fact that Joe Biden's documents inherently are more illegal than Trump's because he was VP and the VP doesn't have the authority to declassify things just like Mike Pence doesn't have that authority? Absolutely. All I'm saying is there might be something they can get him on. And it sounds like they have some phone call recordings that, that he said some stuff on and a bunch more. So we'll see. But I, I don't really agree with this. You have to support him now thing. Because I also think that for these people that love 5D chess, that seems like very 1D chess to me. It seems like you would just be falling into their trap. Like, oh, we'll get, we're gonna prosecute the guy knowing we're never gonna let him win. Or it's gonna be so mucked up, he'll never even be able to campaign really. And we'll get everybody to support him because there are no new Trump voters. I mean, that, that really is a problem that he has. Who is a new Trump voter? They, they don't exist. But who are new DeSantis voters? There's a lot actually of ex-lefties who are coming across voting Republican for the first time. Uh, I'm a registered Republican now for the first time. It doesn't mean I'm a laminated card carrying Republican on every issue, obviously. Uh, but there's a whole lot of people like that. And there's also disaffected Trump people. I did, a, I did an event, and I know this is just anecdotal, but I think you'll, you'll see why I think there's value to this. I did an event about two months ago, so this is before DeSantis announced, in Green Bay, Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin. It was about 400 people, students, donors, faculty, you know, nice age range, say 17 to 60s, 70s. At the, at the middle of the show, I could tell, it was right when people were saying DeSantis was gonna get in, so I, I could tell that's what everyone wanted to talk about. I said, by a show of hands, how many of you guys voted Trump last time? Literally every hand in the room. I said, how many of you would prefer DeSantis this time? It was basically everybody except for about seven people. Now that's not because these people all suddenly hate Trump. It's because a lot of people are just like, it's just enough now. It's just enough now, there's a better option. Let's try that. Again, that does not dismiss anything that you just said there about selective prosecution. Um, but I think it's a, it's a very, uh, it's a slippery slope, man. If you suddenly you're just going to vote for people because they're, they're the most attacked or something like that. Just wait till the machine attacks DeSantis, which, yeah, that's, which that's, do it, that's by Santis, the way. Yes. Uh, here's another criticism of DeSantis where it's not really, it's kind of a wash between him and Trump, which is as governor and having supermajorities now in, in Congress, my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, spending has not decreased under him. So if you're someone like myself who's con 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 concerned about the size of the federal budget, uh, obviously I don't vote, but there's no one to pick to, uh, with. Trump for the first two years increased spending over um, Obama. Uh, DeSantis has increased spending as governor of Florida. If he gets elected, even with a Republican Congress, I don't see any evidence that they're going to try to shrink the budget at all. Well, I think, well, first off, I, I would actually need to see some numbers on that. I mean, I knew, I know that Florida actually has quite an impressive uh, surplus and our GDP, I think is like the 13th in the entire world. Also keep in mind, we have no state income tax here. Yeah, sure. So, you know, one of the funny things when you move from a state like California that has either the highest or second highest to New York state income tax, uh, the fact that I'm saving money to live in Florida yeah. is insane to me. I didn't move here to save money. Uh, it's a nice benefit, but it's not as if our roads don't work. It's not as if our schools don't work. Actually, our roads are way more functional. Our services here are way more functional. Our schools, without question, are way oh, yes. more functional. So I think, so I'm more than happy to have, if one of your guys wanna Google it right now, like find out exactly what the, the, the expenditures sure. have grown by since he's right been now. here. Um, but I think his ethos is to not have the government do everything. And by the way, when we had Hurricane Ian, which was less than a year ago, you know, a category five, in essence, hurricane, that was, as he described it, a biblical once in a hundred year hurricane, uh, FEMA did not do a tremendous amount for Florida. Florida came in and took its budget surplus and has done incredible work fixing Southwest Florida and the bridges and the causeways and all this stuff. So I think, do we all want politicians to spend less and take less and all those things? Yes. I think there's at least some, some track record that he will go in that direction. But I, I would really want to know more about the spending specifically. So it, it, so last year, I just looked it up, 2022 was 112 billion. This year it's 117 billion. So it has m slightly, and that's probably with inflation, it's probably a wash uh, year to year. Right, with inflation, it's, it actually might be a little cut. bit less. And yes, I, would also yes. want to, I would also want to know what the income of the state was at the same time. Uh, obviously, you know, you also have to keep in mind, we got a million, almost a million and a half people. So think about all of the money that has now come into Florida. You have all of this new money. You have building everywhere. And by the way, when I interviewed DeSantis last time, which was about uh, three months ago or so, 
I said to him, you know, Governor, the one issue that I'm seeing in Florida is that house prices obviously are going up because sure. everybody's coming here. This is a, it's a product of success, but it's a good issue. He said, first off, well, we're cutting a bunch of regulation related to buildings so we can build faster. Oh, that's great. Okay. So that, that's one thing. The other thing that he told me that more people should know about because, you know, you get a million plus people, you have X amount of cars now on the road, all sorts of things. Uh, he said there were seven infra massive infrastructure projects that had 20 year timelines in Florida. So meaning that they set these things up and they would say within 20 years, right. we will complete these things. He escalated them all to seven years. So we had projects that were that he skipped 13 years on because it can be done. You know, you do things in sequences, but I would say that that's competent and clear governance. So uh, relative to the numbers that you just read me there, which, you know, not, you know, if you factor in inflation and the amount of people, my guess is that spending actually went down per capita. Yeah, that actually does make sense because those 1.5 million people are also going to need services. So they're going to need, you're going to have road damage to roads. You're going to have more kids in schools, so on and so forth. So I think that's a, that's a fair argument. Folks, have you ever skipped a workout because it drinks the night before? If you're committed to your healthy routine this year, you need Z-Biotics. It is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. It's designed to work like your liver, but in your gut where you need it most. Give Zbiotics a try for yourself. Go to zbiotics.com slash malice. You get 15% off your first order when you use malice at checkout. Here's the thing, 100% money back guarantee. If you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Head to zbiotics.com slash malice. Use code malice at checkout for 15% off. Thank you, Zbiotics, for sponsoring this episode. Folks, if you've been on the fence about buying gold and silver, have you seen what's going on around us? The Silicon Valley Bank collapse, the government bailing them out with our taxpayer money, possibly uh, Xi Jinping's meeting with Putin in Russia. And behind the scenes, while we're not paying attention, MasterCard, Citigroup, all those big global banking giants, they're starting a digital dollar pilot or Biden bucks, which Biden has fast-tracked this development. What does that mean? It means that the Fed can monitor every transaction and devalue purchasing power even more. The corporate press wants you to watch Biden give away money to Ukraine. Even Republican presidential hopefuls are singing that same tune as they announce their bid for 2024. You know where else they have digital money? China. Yes, seriously. China's digital currency helps the CCP punish or coerce citizens with social credit systems. If a citizen commits a minor infraction, you can be blacklisted from traveling, going to restaurants, renting a home, or even having insurance. You don't think that could happen here? Look what happened during COVID. Digital is currently a major step in expanding digital authoritarianism. Meanwhile, according to Bloomberg, the world is in the midst of a macroeconomic reset, but the shining star is gold. The Wall Street Journal has stated that gold prices may be headed for record highs this year. So, Call the proud Americans of the Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late and mention my name. That's Michael Malice. You'll always get best in class service from Patriots protecting Patriots. Patriot Gold Group has the no fee for life IRA where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold or silver. You may be eligible for the no fee for life IRA and qualifying rollovers. All you got to do is call 888-505-9845 to get a free investor guide or just go to malicegold.com. Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs' top-rated gold IRA dealer six years in a row. So call 888-505-9845 or just go to malicegold.com. Let's get back to the show. I saw you got into it with Vivek, who's also been a guest on this show in the past yeah. um, on, on Twitter, and you, you went back and forth. Can you uh, explain to people what happened there and what is where that things stand right now? And by the way, if people don't know, just today, he, I think, did a great – it was a stunt, but I think it was a great stunt where he said he has pledged as president he would pardon Donald Trump and that he wants every other Republican candidate to make that same pledge as well. And that kind of makes sense to kind of um, distribute the risk because if they're a united front, then you can't really go after any individual for doing that. What, sure, can you look, explain it, that back and forth? Go ahead. Just, well, just real quick on that. You know, look, it obviously is a stunt to some degree, but politics is about stunts. Sure. So he wants, he wants to get in on it and, you know, get, get his name out there and all that. You know, the, the problem with doing a stunt like that is if it turns out that Trump really did do some stuff, like I described with the classified docs or whatever else is coming down the pike, to, to preemptively be like, oh, sure. the guy did do a bunch of shit. But I'm going to, you know, I'm going to pardon him regardless. That, that shows you why stunts usually are just stunts and not actual principal positions. But I, I think 
in some ways, what he was trying to do there, I, I sort of agree with what you, where, the reason that you like it. Like, we need to show some unified front on this, which, by the way, I mean, DeSantis, I thought, issued an excellent statement on that. As for the little spat between, uh, between Vivek and I, look, I've had Vivek on the show a couple times. We've done some events together, PragerU events. I've, I've met him at some other things. Um, one of my disappointments with Vivek, and I've aired this with him, I was the first guest on his podcast, which was only two months ago or so, is I kept saying to him, you know, it seems odd to me that you are relentlessly going after DeSantis and never going after Trump. So the, one of the things that he kept going, well, first off, he kept going off on DeSantis on Disney. And I, and I felt uh, that he was in essence lying about what was going on. I mean, DeSantis took away special rights. What anyone who I think likes Michael Malice wants out of a government, if a government must exist, is that we would all have equal rights, right? And the government would get out of the way that Disney as a corporation should not have special privileges and rights and water rights and zoning rights and tax breaks and everything else, that it's competition in Orlando like SeaWorld and Universal Studios and Gator World don't have. DeSantis just took that stuff away. So he actually removed the crony part from capitalism and he evened the playing field. So first Vivek was going after him on that. And I just was saying, this was a few weeks ago and I was saying, you know, I think that's a little misguided. Anyway, that passed. But then this, uh, he was really going after him about uh, call, saying that DeSantis signed a hate speech bill. Right. So I have actually, I asked my guys to print it for me. I have all the bullets of this uh, oh, proposed okay. hate speech bill. It is a property rights bill. Now, again, anyone that, that likes Michael Malice knows a little bit about property rights and the few things that the government's supposed to do, if it's supposed to do anything at all. And in essence, and, and I, if you disagree with me on any of this, uh, feel free to chime in, obviously. Um, in essence, it's all about property rights. It's not, you can, there's nothing that you cannot say in Florida that you can say in Ohio where he lives. What he did was he tightened some laws around property rights. So for example, you cannot print, say, um, a flyer with the Prophet Muhammad in drag and every day drop it off in the mailbox of a Muslim family. That would then be illegal. That's not stopping anyone's free speech. You can print Muhammad in drag flyers all you want, but you can't bring it onto people's property and endlessly harass them. That's one example. Another example, and this was happening in Florida, you cannot, if you are, say, a neo-Nazi, you cannot take a projector and project a giant swastika on a temple from across the street, thus getting around the law, meaning normally you would have to spray it on their thing, which would be an obvious violation of property rights. So he expanded some things, but if you wanna have a swastika in your house, and you want to pray to a shrine of Hitler and blah, 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 just like the ACLU, when the ACLU was a sane organization in the 70s, was for the Nazis marching in Skokie, Illinois, then go ahead and do it. So all of the things, I mean, I can, I can, go, I can go on more of them, all of the things had to do with property rights, not hate speech. There's nothing you can't say in Florida that, that somehow you can say in, in Ohio. And basically I challenged him. I said, hey, let me get out there and I'll try to say something in Florida. And he just would not give me a straight answer. And then I think what escalated it was, I said something to the effect of, are you coordinating with Trump? Because everyone online thinks it. Everyone online thinks he's kind of doing Trump's dirty work. And then his campaign, uh, not campaign manager, I think one of his PR people or something accused me of taking money from the DeSantis campaign, not even as a question, said, you are taking money, I am not. And he was okay with that lie. And I tried to correct him on it and he, you know, it is what it is, and it's it's an odd thing, isn't it? An odd thing for guys like us that you end up fighting with these people. Uh, I kind of like. I haven't actually done it. I have. A, it's really kind of funny because you get a lot of heat because uh, you run your show in a manner similar to me. When I, someone is a guest on my show, I take that word seriously. I don't want them to feel uncomfortable or to have negative consequences to, or to regret it. I can get a little more heat if someone I have a personal relationship with, like you or Dave Smith or, or somebody else, because we know we're not going to try to dunk on each other. We're going to be intellectually honest, and we're going to shake hands when the conversation is done. But I've never really gotten into it, like especially publicly. And what was interesting about you going back before the vague is you had invited him, you know, you're like, hey, come sit down, come on my show where I don't push back hard. I will be a very extremely gracious host to the point where people attack me for how gracious right. I am. And we could have this very friendly, nice conversation in the beautiful city of Miami. The local studio or, or in your house, whatever your yeah. studio is, is lovely. Let, let's make this happen. So what came of that? Did they take accept your invitation? Well, they claim that we had not reached out to them. Right. I mean, first off, I've had him on several times. And then I, and then once his 
PR person or whoever it was said that that said publicly, you have not reached out to us. I said, well, actually, here's the email that we sent last week. Here's the follow up from yeah. yesterday. And I had my assistant obviously block out the email addresses, but it's the same person who still works for him that we always coordinated with. He's in Miami now. They know where we are. Um, that's why these things, they end up becoming like, it, it's a weird thing, I think, something that I've, I'm, I don't want to say I'm struggling with it, but it's something that's on my mind a lot lately as, as I'm now known more for what I think rather than, than just interviewing people. Um, and that's a, that was a conscious decision by me. I, I felt like I had something to share after all these years. I think I can communicate these ideas fairly well and like in a, in a somewhat fun way. I'm not yelling about politics all the time, right. you know, all that stuff. And I've learned, I've, you know, I've had the privilege of touring with Jordan Peterson. You know, I've learned from you. I've learned from, you know, all these people that I think I can communicate a lot of really complex stuff in ways that the average person can, can listen to in a nice way. And I think maybe that, that's what my skill is, something like that. Um, it's been a challenge now to interview people because in the old days, I, you, you said it, I used to get criticized because I was too nice, right? Like that was the thing. Oh, Dave's a softball interviewer. My feeling was, let me hear what these people have yeah. to say. That really was my feeling. And now, you know, at, you have to also remember when I started doing this back in like 2014 or so, sort of long form interviews, really nobody was doing it. Rogan was starting at the same time as me, but there were very few, you know, I, Larry King was my hero and he ended up being one of my, my mentors. And we shot our show out of the same studio for a while. And I was with him just days before he passed away. Um, but long form had kind of disappeared. I came back and I was like, let's just have respectful conversation and see what happens. Then as I guess my profile grew or whatever you want to call it, as I started saying what I thought more, I've found it to be a little more difficult to be an interviewer because now when I have, especially politicians on, when my audience knows I disagree with them, I want to be respectful and I don't want to turn it into a debate. Right. And that, that has become a challenge for me. And I, I don't know exactly what to do with that. I, I'm not enjoying interviewing as much because of it. It's like, if I have you on, it's a little different because you're not a politician. So it's like, me and you could either agree or disagree, but I also, you know, we'll also have a drink after right. and shoot the shit and everything else. With a politician, it's a little bit different because if, if let's say I have, so like Tulsi, who I absolutely adore and I've interviewed her a million times and, you know, we've had dinners and blah, blah, blah. Like she hasn't quite gotten there on guns, let's say yet. Now, if my audience knows I'm there, but she's not, but I want to treat her with respect, they're going to be frustrated with me. So that sort that's like a very simple example of how these things can start becoming complex. Yeah, let's talk a little about Tulsi, who stole my look. Um, I'm kind of, I don't, <laughs> she I, did, she I, what, did. What, what I don't, and I, this is kind of like playing telephone, but I don't understand how you can go from being a Bernie bro, uh, which she was, she left the DNC because of the unfair treatment of Bernie Sanders, to endorsing Dan Baldich in New Hampshire and Carrie Lake in uh, um, Arizona. These are not moderate Republicans, these are hardcore. MAGA Republicans, and she's not, I, I, I would bet money, doesn't identify as MAGA in any way. So that to me is something that's hard to wrap my head around. Oh, that's it. That's interesting. I'm surprised that you don't see that because you dole out red pills like nobody's business. I, I think what happened to somebody like Tulsi, you have to remember, first off, she had to go through a Democrat primary with that evil machine. That yes. evil machine, if you think that evil machine is red pilling the way you're red pilling, meaning that people see the corruption and then suddenly they're red pilled, she actually went through that. Yeah, okay. Remember, she was the last candidate going against Biden. Everybody else cut their deals, Pete Buttigieg, and everybody cut their deals the day before Super Tuesday. I think right. it was quite literally the Monday. Monday yes, it was, they literally. Cut, yes. Yeah, they cut their deals. They all get out. She was fighting. And then you know what happened? Hillary Clinton said that she was a Russian asset. This is a woman who, for whatever political disagreements you and I might have with her, not only is she absolutely lovely, as you know, but she's serving in our military right now. She's in the reserves, I think, I think literally right this second, like leading a battalion in the reserves, which she, which she loves to do. And now she's a Russian asset. So she was so attacked by that evil monster that I think it red pilled her in like a very, I don't want to say radical way, but I think in a very rapid way. And then when you throw COVID on top of that, well, then she started really, I think, seeing things in a very clear way. So she campaigned with, um, who was the girl that ran, I'm blanking on her name, uh, ran against Gretchen Whitmer in, uh, in uh, Michigan. Uh, 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 Tudor Dixon. Uh, Tudor Dixon, thank you. So she ran with her. You know, most of the people that she campaigned with lost because as we talked about, it did not go well for the Republicans in the, in the midterms. I don't think she agrees with um, 
with any of these people on everything, certainly Carrie Lake on everything, and I definitely don't think she considers herself like MAGA, 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 but I think she did put herself out there and say, I'm no longer a Democrat, and what that means right now is I've got to fight the Democrat Party. By the way, RFK Jr., it's the exact same situation. By the time they are done with RFK Jr., yeah. it's not that he won't be a Democrat anymore. In essence, he'll be a libertarian for a while, and I bet you seven years from now, if he still wants to be in politics, he'll be, he'll be a Republican. We no, only have two parties in functioning sense, and that's just kind of the, the evolution. He'll, he'll that be an think. unperson. Where they'll oh, right, pretend or, he doesn't or, exist. or they'll kill him. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but I, I meant more the fact that they'll pretend he doesn't exist and just like yeah. completely ignore him, like they did with much of Tulsi's criticisms of Officer Harris during did the Did you the see, did, Michael, did you see, you know, I, I always quote you your line about uh, the corporate press is the enemy of the people, and I always yes. take these headlines that prove it, and I, I tweet you all the time. Yeah. Did you see the one a couple of days ago? It was on the weekend, so I didn't do it because I try not to tweet on the weekends about his wife, Cheryl Hines. You know, he's married to Cheryl Hines. Oh, the New York who, Times, yeah. yeah. The New York Times had this thing about how it like, has all these questions. Yeah, yeah, that one. But, but the, the end of the headline was, because Cheryl Hines, who plays Larry David's wife on Curb Your Enthusiasm, she's a really successful actress, it happens to be RFK's wife. And it was basically like, you know, uh, she's still supporting her husband, but uh, ex uh, despite all of his dangerous ideas or something yeah. to that effect. And it was like, what the hell are you people talking about? He wants a secure border. He'd like to know a little bit more about where COVID came from and, and vaccine injuries. Which dangerous ideas? You mean that he's not a complete whack job progressive and he believes that boys have penises and girls have vaginas? Well, I guess that is dangerous. To but that is dangerous because yeah. if you are going against the narrative, you're in COVID, you're a danger to the elderly and you want everyone to die. Uh, if you are, you want trans kids to be vanished and erased, if you're against, you know, having biological males compete with biological females, it, they really have set this binary where it's either you are in favor of Biden or you're literally a member of the Klan, card carrying member of the Klan. And, but the thing is that works, it works for Karen. Karen who watches CNN and reads the New York Times or the New Yorker has no other source of information. And they'll just run that picture from Charlottesville with everyone with the torches are yelling. And it's like, and then you have a picture of Kamala Harris eating a uh, corn dog. It's pretty easy to, which just from those two photos, if you're an alien coming to earth, which you're gonna pick. Well, look, I think part of the problem right now is there's such an asymmetry between the perceived amount of power that corporate media has and the reality that yes, it has. Yes, yes. When you remember, remember about a year ago when ev there was that like two week span where everybody was trying to cancel Joe Rogan because they grabbed you know, him saying the N word. He never said it pejoratively. He was always mocking people who say the N word basically. Right. He was never saying, oh, you're, you're, you know, yes, he was never course. doing it in a racist manner. But the reason CNN was doing that coverage every single day was not because Brian Stelter or Jim Acosta or Jake Tapper thought that Joe Rogan was racist. It was because they know he was the competition. He's right. pulling, in, pulling in numbers they could never get. Our live stream yesterday did about 350, 350,000 live on YouTube and another about 150,000 live on Rumbles concurrently. So that's about 500,000 people that watched my live show yesterday. That is so much bigger than every single show on CNN, every single show on MSNBC and everything else. I got three guys in studio with me. I'm just telling people what I think, but people know that it's more authentic and I'm gonna screw some things up. I correct things sure. if I, I, yes. I, I love correcting things. By the way, sometimes in the show, I'll have got a number wrong or I'll accidentally say something the wrong way or whatever. I love correcting myself because I'm like, yeah, I'm human. At least I'm not pretending. But I think the asymmetry that you're talking about, that the Karens, it's hard to know how much influence the Karens have anymore. Because on one hand, you, you could turn on the view and you hear the most psychotic lunacy the, from- The Karen from, mothership. Yep. Right. It's the Karen mother. That, right. That's great. It is. So it's like, but you hear this stuff and then you're like, okay, so they're brainwashing all the Karens and all those soccer moms. And then on the other hand, it's like, actually the view does get decent numbers. I'm very proud that my show is on at exactly the same time as the view. So hopefully we can keep pulling people from the view. But the question is, as people tune out of CNN and MSNBC and everything else, how much attention basically do we have to pay to right. these things? Like how many people really at the end, even the Karens, even the most Karen-y Karen, -y Karen how many of them are there that are like, you know what? I've listened to The View for the last year. 
And Whoopi Goldberg really does get it. Joy Behar knows what's up. I'm a Democrat. I don't know what the answer to that is. I don't know. I think I do. I think Karen's the swing vote in America. I think suburban white women are the ones who decide elections, such as presidential elections. And I think COVID demonstrated to what extent they're completely subjugated by the edicts of the New York Times and CNN and ABC, NBC, and CBS, mind you. It's like CNN, you know, it's pretty obvious they have a left of center um, perspective, but mildly MSNBC doesn't pretend and more power to them. They want to be a progressive network. Go, go nuts. But they, I, I and I think this cost Trump because at a certain point, you and I like the mean tweets because they're funny and we retweet it, but soccer moms don't like it. They like things to have this very waspy air of gentility and everything's nice and you don't offend people. And, you know, and this is a, this is a big issue in my opinion. But, well, by the way, that's why it's so evil what they're doing with DeSantis right now, because think about all of the people, right? This was a, this was a mainstream thought. I like Trump. I, I like the policies. I like the policies of Trump. Oh, peace in the Middle East. That's pretty good. Oh, new, no new wars. That's pretty good. Oh, the economy before COVID chugging along. Oh, lowest all-time black unemployment, lowest all-time Hispanic unemployment, blah, blah, blah. I, like all, I don't like the mean tweets. I don't like the, the grabbing by the pussy, blah, blah. Now you have all of those policies, and I would argue better ones, in DeSantis. DeSantis, who's younger, younger than me, he's 44 years old, three young kids, a fantastic wife. Casey's really wonderful like a good family man, you know, as I think they've done all the oppo research that there is, the, the guy's never raped anybody or anything else. It's like, but they, now they are, you have Trump and MSNBC are on the same side, right? lying about DeSantis every day so that we covered it this morning. At the Tonys two nights ago, they have this woman from Hamilton, the musical, walk out there and say, oh, and uh, something about the governor of my home state of Florida. Uh, oh, not my governor, the grand wizard of the KKK. And it's like, and then these idiots, they clap. Oh, throw me an R, 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 give me another fish, they, another fish. Here's the other thing. The Klan doesn't really like the Italians, to put it mildly. <laughs> but it's, you laugh, but it's true. Like if you're going to no, stick with the narrative, they're not big fans. Sinatra did not like the Klan, and the Klan yes. did not like Sinatra. You're Welcome with Michael Malice is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Folks, most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, you're listening to me talk, but you're also driving, cleaning, exercising, maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you could be doing right now, which is getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you can save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company affiliates, national average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Let's get back to the show. Um, let's, and by the way, just speaking, uh, let's pivot a little bit. Speaking of the malevolence of the corporate press, for those who still doubt how purely evil these people are, look back at how they went after DeSantis for taking a day off to look after his wife while she was dealing with cancer and how many people are like, they were calling for him to resign or it's unacceptable. We don't know where he is while he's going with her to get cancer treatment. And when you, when you see that you realize, okay, there is no line that these people will not cross in, in order to further uh, their pursuit of power. Uh, I, no, I'm sure you were an eyewitness to that. And, and we're just, even at this point, there's still possibility for me to feel disgusted at what they do. Isn't that weird for you, though? Because, you know, because you, you and I are, are, I don't know if you have a better phrase for it, maybe like internet creatures, like we've been in sure. the Twitter thing for so long, like whatever that is, I always tell my mom, and my mom's still a little bit more of a, of a she's a liberal in what liberals used to be, so she's still struggling with the, re, you know, and, and I think people, I think there's a lot of people like that, people in their sort of 60s to maybe upper 70s who really cannot believe what happened to the Democrat Party. They can't. So they're still a little lost in some of that stuff. But I always tell my mom, I'm like, mom, I see how the sausage is made. Yeah, yeah. I see it. I see the things that are happening online that six months later burst into mainstream. I go to events where I see reality. You know, like for, a, a very easy one of this would be, and, and you were at some of these, when I did my, uh, the tour with Jordan Peterson, I literally, no matter what city we went into, front page in the newspaper, 
white supremacist, uh, MAGA Jordan Peterson with the incels and the uh, coming to town, mass protest. And then you'd go to the event and Jordan Peterson talks about getting your life in order. He doesn't talk about race. Man. There's almost nothing about race. Almost, actually, one of, you know, one of the great lines that he had, he would use, you know, he doesn't, re he doesn't repeat a lot of the same stuff, but one great line that he would use all the time, or not all the time, maybe, maybe a dozen times at a, at a hundred plus shows that we did, he would say, how many of you here in the audience uh, think you would have been Nazis? And of course, yeah, nobody yeah. raised their hands. And then he goes, well, that proves you probably would have been a Nazi. Meaning, meaning that we all go along with the thing. Yes. But he almost never really talked about race. He would, he would talk about the problems, obviously, of collectivism and, and that sort of thing. But that's what I mean about seeing how it's all made. I would literally be seeing front page New York Times articles about how he is for enforced monogamy, which sounded like it was right out of The Handmaid's Tale, and that Jordan Peterson wants women to be subservient. And all enforced monogamy is, is it's the concept of marriage. The yeah. other two times that the phrase enforced monogamy had ever been in the New York Times, both times were positive. It was talking about the positive virtues of marriage. So that sort of thing, I think, lends guys like us. We see this stuff early and then it's like, oh, could the world just catch up? But maybe that's our lot in life, Malice. I, I, this is something where I, I, I know you're going to kind of like sigh because you're probably exhausted at this point. But I have to ask because yeah. I know it's personal for you. This whole thing with this um, uh, don't say gay law. And then, you know, being told that uh, there was NAACP and there was some gay organization, I forget what it was, where supposedly gay people are fleeing, Flo fleeing Florida, uh, Miami. I love the idea that gay people don't feel safe in Miami. Um, that they're fearing for their lives, that this is going to be, uh, uh, what was that kid who was tied up and left to die overnight? Um, oh, Ryan, what, not Ryan, no, it was Ryan, Ryan White, something. White, Ryan White's Ryan. the eighth, Ryan, whatever his name, the kid that, basically, Dave, you're one step away from going in the street and having your head bashed in with a crowbar, uh, and your kids are going to be, you know, great harm will come to them. Can you, from your perspective as a Floridian, as a conservative, as a gay man, talk about, you know, the propaganda about that law and, and the reality? Michael, it's so freaking evil. And the fact that, and this is what the media does with everything, there was no don't say gay bill. The word gay was not even in the bill. It was, it was HB 1557, which was Parental Rights and Education Act. They didn't want teachers, state employees, talking to kids about sex and gender when you're in fourth grade, fifth grade, right. then now they've escalated it even older, which I actually don't have a problem with that. Um, and for example, my, my oldest son's name is Justin. Imagine if he was, he's, he's nine months, but imagine if he was six years old, so he's in first grade, and I sent him to public school, and after three months, I found out that the teacher was actually secretly calling him Justine, and I did not know that for three months, and in class, they referred to him as a girl. That is criminal. I actually believe that is criminal. That is what they removed. You know, back in the day, back in our day, Michael, remember if, you're, if you went on a school trip to the petting zoo, you had to get a parental consent. Yes. Form. The petting zoo, sounds like a sex club, but it's not as far as I know, it probably is, but probably you got is. my point. <laughs> right, it probably is. The petting zoo, I don't even go there anymore. I stole that from the Golden Girls, that was Blanche. Remember that line? Did you get the, the auction I just, items? I didn't get, somebody got it. You sent me <sighs> Blanche's dress. No, it was the, the it was a rose. Oh, it you was sent a, me the you sent me the Sunny and Cher thing. Yeah, also. yeah, yeah. They were crazy amount of money, and they okay. went for way higher. And yeah. Okay. Anyway, but you remember the line I'm referring to? The, of course, the petting yes. zoo. I don't even go there anymore. Yeah. Um, anyway, the point is, this was all about should parents know what's going on in the classroom, and should we be teaching about gender and sex and sexuality at at these early years and all that? And of course, every sane person knows the answer is no. When I do public events, I always do a poll now. I say, I say, everybody in this room, I want you to think about your third grade teacher for a moment. You could do this right now, Michael. Think about your third grade teacher. What was her name? I don't even remember. I'm not kidding. You, you don't even remember? No. But try to imagine that person talking to you about sex or right. gender. Right. Yeah, of course. Yes. That's the point. My third grade teacher, her name was Miss Kochenauer. She read us The Secret Garden and I loved her because she did all the voices. I thought she was like 150 years old, like the oldest woman ever. She was probably in her 50s, like, but that's what you think when you're a kid. The point is, if she had secretly been saying to me, Dave, what are you interested in sexually? And let's talk about it privately. Everyone would have known that's completely insane. That is all DeSantis did here in Florida. Everyone knows it was the right thing to do. And I think it's great that he did it also because it has now unearthed a, a much more important conversation that we had to have, 
which is what is the role of public education into private matters? And I don't think kids, you know, we, when I was in seventh grade, the health class, the guy brought in a banana and a condom. We all laughed at him, thought it was freaking ridiculous. We can have some honest discussion about whether sex, sex and gender should be discussed, but that's not really what this is about. Go see what Libs of TikTok is posting every day. There is a massive movement to confuse kids. I'll say one other thing on this. My, my five-year-old nephew, my sister has three kids, lives here in Miami. They came over a couple weeks ago. My five-year-old nephew, I'm in the pool with him, and he says, he's looking at my two boys, and he says, there's, there's no mommies here. There's no mommies here. Uh, what, where's the mommy? Now, I had an interesting moment. I have his best interest in mind. I love this kid. I love my sister and my brother-in-law. You, you know my sister and my brother-in-law. Yeah. Like, I love them. But it's not my duty to explain this. So fortunately, with a five-year-old, you can change the topic very quickly. But then I did what I felt was right. I said to my sister as they were leaving, I said, hey, by the way, he asked me about this. He may not remember. Maybe he'll, he won't ask you again for two years or whatever, but just so you know, and she said, thank you. Now think about it. I have his best interest in mind, and I knew it was not my place to talk about right. that with him. These people, I don't know whose best interest they have in mind, but they think it's their duty. They, if you listen to what many of these teachers say, they say, these are our children. My children are not their children. And Joe, uh, Hunter Biden is not my kid either. And, and that really is, I think, the essence of all of this. Uh, but I mean, are you, I know- Under attack? I, no, I, I know at least a couple of couples who fled California because under California's laws, if you have a person who had, including a child, who has gender questions about their gender, it could be a tom. You and I both grow up with the tomboy or the sissy, sure. these non-gender um, conforming children. In California, if they go see a therapist, if that therapist tries to steer them away from transitioning uh, or reaffirming them as trans, they will lose their license. So there's an enormous incentive for them to have that kid double down. And anyone who goes to the petting zoo or any of these other clubs will see plenty of very effeminate males who, are not, who fought for decades to be like, I am not a girl. I'm just a swish dude, accept me for what I am. Then the second they're accepted, like, all right, like the guy in Will and Grace, whatever his name right. is, I don't watch uh, that show. Sean Hayes, yeah. Sean Hayes. Now it's like, no, we got to pump you full of estrogen. And we're also not going to talk about the effects that hormones have on the human mind, which everyone who understands if a bodybuilder's on testosterone, which is steroids, if a woman is pregnant and having her hormones, it makes your brain have certain consequences. But suddenly, if you have this effeminate boy or this masculine girl or just any boy or girl and you give them hormones, suddenly their brains are going to work normally. That makes no sense to me. Michael, the other part of this, and Jordan Peterson discusses this quite often, is that Let's say that someone genuinely, the, this, the, the point zero zero one or whatever the percentage is, is genuinely, by every estimation that we can gauge psychology, believes they are in the opposite body. So they, they truly, fundamentally, having gone through every test we can figure out and everything else, they think they're in the, the, the wrong body. Just because you chemically castrate yourself and, I, and chop off your breasts or your genitals and pump yourself full of hormones and all, it does not mean you're going to be happier on the other side. Right. And in most cases, you are not. In most cases, you are not, which is why the detransition movement is huge. And there is going to be, wait till we see a, a, another 10 years out of this, when the generation of kids yeah, that they yeah. have mutilated and drugged, and not, and not only drugged because of hormones, all the ADHD stuff, all a generation growing up on drugs and Tumblr and weird sexual shit online and everything else, the, the vengeance that these people are going to want from their parents and the doctors is going to be deranged. I, I, I think their, that's a Pandora's box that we're going to open. Yeah. Not their parents, it's the moms. No, it's, it's not, mostly, no, of course, it's, it's mostly the moms. moms. Mostly and here's moms. the other thing, just a broader, broader point to literally everyone watching this. We, as humans, have this idea that that which we like least about ourselves once we resolve that, our problems will go away. So if someone is very overweight, they think, oh, I can't get a girlfriend because I'm, I'm short, right? Uh, so a lot of short guys will be like, oh, I can't get a girlfriend because I'm short, but lots of short guys have girlfriends. So you kind of think that whatever you don't like about yourself caused all your problems. So you think, okay, it's because I'm not presenting as male or female. Once that's flipped, every, like dominoes, everything can fall into place. Let me tell you something. 
every biological male and biological female has plenty of problems in their lives. So if you just fix that, think everything else is gonna be fine, that's absolutely fallacious. You're, you're so right, and it's basically an episode of Black Mirror. It's like, okay, so, so you're a little bit on the short side, Michael. So it's like, okay, in five years from now, or whatever it is, you'll be able to get robotic legs. Like, they'll be able to literally, within our lifetimes, they're gonna chop, this well, is Well, they could do it now, did you know yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, they can do it now, in essence, yeah. but the transhumanist movement, this is what they wanna do. If you, you're, you're too short, we're gonna extend your legs. Okay, if you think that then, well, then I'll be taller, and I'll find the girl I want, because I'm taller, a lot of girls are going to be like, you know, that's a little weird. You've got robotic legs. Like, it's or a you, little or bizarre. You're like, hey, you're taller, but you're an asshole. Yeah, so now you're, you're just still a taller an asshole. asshole. It, it's, it, but, it, but it's, it, we laugh, but yeah. we're because we're old men. When you're 14, 15, 16, you don't have this perspective. So you kind of will think, okay. And when you're told this won't solve your problem, then you get defiant because it's like you're keeping my solution away from me. You want it's same thing with, with when we were kids. Uh, and I'm positive this is the same phenomenon. I think virtually every girl we knew had an eating disorder phase. It's about control to not, not be comfortable yeah. with their body changing. They grow out of it. And they also see once they get super skinny, their problems don't go away. They still have mental issues. They still feel insecure. Maybe they're being bullied, so on and so forth. But with you know, this, you know, it's irreversible. Well, one other quick thing on this. You know, this it's so funny because these people who think that gender doesn't exist and it's a construct and everyone's non-binary and all of this fluidity, they also have this bizarre thing that if you're a five-year-old boy and you like pink, you must be a girl, yeah, right, right. right? So in some ways, they're the most actually uh, structured in their view of what sexuality is. Um, I think we discussed this once before, but you know, when I was growing up, I, I liked what were traditional boy things. I liked G.I. Joe and Transformers and, and He-Man and all of, of that stuff. Of course you like G.I. Joe and He-Man. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, there's, okay, there's definitely some jokes in there, fine. Um, I got it. Transformers oh, like more than meets the eye. It's all there, fine. But, but the point is nobody would have been like, oh, right. there's Dave Rubin, like let's make him a girl. Now there were effeminate boys that most likely grew up, will hopefully have grown up to be somewhat functional gay men, that they literally would be chemically castrating them now. That is so psychotic and dangerous. And that's why I've said for quite some time, there is no movement in America that is more radically anti-gay than the trans movement. The trans movement is the most anti-gay and anti-female movement that there is. It's anti-female because they want dudes to beat girls in wrestling and in basketball. And it's anti-gay because they literally want to chop young boys' wangs off in essence. And if this was a Christian group, imagine if there was a group of Christians, white male Christians from the patriarchy who were advocating to chemically castrate young gay boys because they wanted to eliminate gayness. Do you think the left would have a problem with right, that? Right, yeah. So, I mean, you agree with the J.K. Rowling critique of all this? Of course. Of course I do. Okay, Dave, uh, we're running out of time. What has been your favorite part of this interview? I mean, you're just the best, Malice. I say it all the time. You, you know, like, you know, we've met so many people in this, in this funny, odd little electronic box world that we live in. <laughs> And you know, some of the people over the years turn out to be really weirdos or they turn on you or they just yep. want something from you. And you and I have become genuine friends throughout this. Like whenever I, whenever you happen to be in town, like we always make sure that, that we can see each other. Or oh, I'm, except I'm the last you time are. when you didn't have time. You and are I, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, Michael. <laughs>